I spent many an hour building this chair and it is too cold to put it outside, so it's going in the video! <laughs> Welcome back, friends. How was your day? Please let me know. Leave it in the comments. I genuinely want to know. I have been replaying some of my favorite video games from the past decade, which you know if you saw the title of the video. I truly believe that some of the best storytelling in the past decade has been in video games. Just because I'm trying to write a cartoon series doesn't mean I should only look at cartoons for examples of great character development, a hilarious dialogue, and a really engaging story arc. In fact, actually by nature, video games have to be clear about story and everything. Because if you are driving the car and you're confused about your destination, or even if you have a destination, it's going to diminish your driving experience. And that's why I thought it would be really fun for us to go over five of my favorite obscure indie video games from the past 10 years with amazing storytelling. In no particular order. If you love New York City, Jazz Age nostalgia, or adorable alligators, or mystery, or dating sim parodies, you will love Later Alligator. You play as someone trying to gather intel for Pat, who believes his family members are trying to orchestrate his assassination. You quickly learn that, no, they're throwing a surprise birthday party. Or are they? But you appease this little alligator and get to meet his whole quirky family tree through a series of quests and mini-games. The writing is clever, the art is charming as heck, and the games were all different enough that I couldn't wait to go on to the next one. Except one mini-game, which I have never successfully done. That's the only downside. The game autosaves, so you can't try again. If you fail, you fail, and you just don't get that family tree member. As you complete tasks for these various family tree members, you also learn about their lives. You learn about how they relate to one another, what they're missing from their life, and it all builds up to this big event, and when it does, you feel like you actually are a member of their family. You also learn a little bit more about Alligator New York City. If you discover enough of the in-game secrets, make the right friends, and click to go to the right underground places. It's not a long play, but it is well worth your time. Also, just look at them. Just look at him. Lamb. Also, just look at these reviews. When I went to New York, I got mugged by hip-hop artists at Times Square. I am happy to report that when I went to Alligator New York, I did not get mugged by alligator hip-hop artists at Alligator Times Square. This is basically Professor Layton, but with alligators, so that makes it automatically like four times better at the very least. The Paddington 2 of video games. I have a rule when browsing for new games. If you see a game has a soundtrack bundle option on Steam, you know that soundtrack slaps. The main theme of To The Moon is called Four River, and it went from my ears to my piano because I just had to learn how to play it. To The Moon doesn't typically have a long playtime, and its graphics are your pretty standard RPG pixels, though they do have a smoothed out quality I appreciate, but everything about it is delightful. You play as two scientists who work for a company that will visit you in your old age and dive into your memories, so right before you die, you think you've done the thing you always wanted to do. That way, you can go off into that sweet good night with no regrets. So they visit this elderly man whose wife has recently passed away. He lives next to a lighthouse and he says he wants to go to the moon, but he's not really sure why he wants to go to the moon and his relationship to the lighthouse seems a little peculiar. So it seems like a challenging but doable task make this man think that he had a life where he could actually go to the moon quickly becomes something a little more complicated. Turns out he's been blocking out a memory from somewhere in his past, which makes it hard for them to implant these false memories. As you go through his childhood memories to solve the mystery, you also wind up on a path to solve the relationship with his wife. It's a beautiful, gentle tale about what you want and what you need and learning how to communicate with the people that you love most. This is also one of the first games I heard of where one of the characters, River, his wife, is actually neurodivergent. And while the elderly man in the story loves her very much, you do learn that he hasn't quite figured out how to listen and connect with her. It's a surprising thing to explore in a video game like this, but it seems really useful and empathetic in a way that I don't usually see. This game knows when to be funny and when to just kind of let the tragedy of heavier events play out. It's one I've never forgotten about, and it's one of the few games that I actually think everyone would be better off for playing. Just as, like, humans. Speaking of games that I would recommend for everyone, not this. I 
absolutely love Lisa the Painful RPG. It started out as a Kickstarter, and as soon as I got my chance to play it, I became obsessed with it. But it pretty much has every kind of trigger warning attached to it that you can imagine. So if you feel like that's going to be damaging to you at all, please skip over this one. But it's worth mentioning because I think it's one of the most unique games I've ever seen. It's turn-based gameplay, nothing super unique there, and its graphics are... Well, its graphics are actually fine because let's just say you won't want them to be any sharper. Its premise is wild. It depicts a post-apocalyptic world in which all women have disappeared, except for one. She's a little girl named Buddy. Maybe it goes without saying, but this is a dangerous world for a lone female and Buddy is kidnapped. You play as Brad, a drug addicted karate master and Buddy's adoptive father who fights through gangs and slums to get her back. Like I mentioned, this game has things like lots of gore, clearly non-consensual acts, incest, memories of people taking their own lives, but nothing felt unwarranted for the world. The world of Lisa is not a good world. It does not pretend to be a world we want to live in, but Brad's fight for the one thing he loves is so touching. You can put a party of fun characters together, but that also means risking their lives. You can sacrifice yourself instead of one of them, but maybe you'll only have one arm the rest of the game. It's up to you. If you're wondering who Lisa is, she's the star of the prequel. She's Brad's sister and she's no longer alive. Brad feels so guilty about not helping his sister when she needed it that he sees her image throughout the game. We see flashes of his past as he looks for Buddy, and we come to understand the tragedy of the world even before the women disappeared. I know I've made it sound dire, but it also has plenty of humor in its writing and heart exactly where it needs it. It shows how people have learned to grapple with this new terrible world. And honestly, given the year we've all had, I think we can kind of relate. It's worth playing for the cast of characters alone. For example, Terry. If you know, you know. Return of the Obra Dinn reminds me of those old Sierra games I'd watch my dad play in the 90s. I don't know why, but it was clearly intentional, and it works. Somehow, the two-tone look makes the mystery aboard the ship even eerier. You play as an insurance inspector who has to figure out what happened to all the people who were once aboard the Obra Dinn, but are now dead or completely missing. Your little pocket watch of death transports you to each character's moment of demise via their corpse. Once there, you get to move around the scene like you're interrupting a mannequin challenge. That girl is a real crowd, please. Small world, all the friends know of me. It tests your deductive reasoning and facial recognition as you match each character's face to their name and cause of death in the logbook. I am such a sucker for stories about sea and mysteries, so I played this one pretty obsessively until I had a complete logbook. I don't want to spoil anything, so I'll just leave you with this. Just when you think you know what kind of story this is, something comes out of the sea. What's interesting about the way Obra Dinn unfolds, which is actually similar to To the Moon, is you play it kind of backwards. You start at the end, just like in To the Moon, you start at the end of this man's life, and then you turn the pages back carefully. So clearly something is wrong with the way this story concludes and then you go backwards in time trying to figure out how we got that way. It becomes very unclear who the heroes and villains are, not because the story is confusing, but because of how complex the Oberdin's journey was. Let's end on a light note. If you know Smile For Me, you really know Smile For Me. This is one of those games I discovered through its fan art because it quickly dominated my Tumblr dashboard when it was released. Like Later Alligator and Return of the Obra Dinn, you play in first person. You play as a flower deliverer who wakes up on the grounds of an enclosed space called the Habitat, which has strong mental hospital vibes. You're told you're being reformed by the mysterious Dr. Habit who believes you're not happy enough. But don't worry, there's some big event coming up. That's not weird at all, right? The art style is bright, angular, and laid out almost like you're walking through a pop-up book. Though some objects are photorealistic, which can be a little unsettling. Each day, you walk around and try to help the other residents with whatever is making them upset. But if night falls before you make it back to your bed, you're transported to your room and subjected to a creepy video. 
You also get less time the next day to finish your tasks because you have slept in. I did this a lot. The gameplay here has a few unique features. For one, you're a silent protagonist, but you communicate with others by nodding yes or no with your mouse. The other feature, which I think is so clever, helps the game move along. Every day you fail to help someone with their task, they give you a more obvious clue. They never spell it out for you, but this kept me from feeling frustrated if I kept doing things wrong. This is another one of those games where minor characters can end up feeling so special, and ancillary pieces of information can actually build a fascinating world. You learn how people in the habitat are connected to each other, you help with their careers, their heartbreaks, their dreams, and hints of these are sprinkled throughout the habitat maybe in the form of an old record or a poster. It's actually really interesting how similar this is to Later Alligator, because all of your missions are character focused. You're always helping people or alligators with whatever they need help with. And by doing that, you build a mosaic that makes a story. The final encounter with Dr. Habit reveals the overall plot and can produce one of a few different endings. All of them are a gut punch. I hope you had as much fun learning about these video games as I did talking about them. Oh, and you can find all of them on Steam if you're interested in playing them. Uh, if you do, or if you have already played them, please let me know what you thought of them. And I know I probably missed a ton of really cool games, so uh, please let me know in the comments below what your favorites were, and I will try to check them out. Also, let me know if you want me to do a part two to this. I have plenty more games I could discuss. I didn't really feel like this was the right space for a Doki Doki Literature Club, but then maybe no space is the right space for Doki Doki Literature Club. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Midnight Oil Collective is putting out new content all the time, not just on YouTube, but on our other socials, which are all listed below. And uh, hey, have a great day. Take some time to yourself. Ooh.